This is DIA Connections. The reality that I had been kidnapped by the very group of people that I was working in and trying to help was startling and, as you can imagine, hard to deal with. Why did this have to change everything? I loved my life before, and I loved what I was doing, and I really believed in it, and I was really happy. And then this changed everything. I'm hearing the worst sounds, people being hit by bullets, falling to the ground, moaning, breathing their last breaths. And all I can think is, I really am never going to survive. Those gripping comments are from Jessica Buchanan. She's the subject of this episode of DIA Connections. Thanks for joining us for part two of our conversation about bringing them home. I hope you had a chance to listen to part one. In that episode, we discussed the Defense Intelligence Agency's role in the POW MIA mission, which dates back to the mid-1960s. But there's more to that mission, which might be less known, but by no means less significant. And that's DIA's role in the planning and execution of rescue and recovery operations, not just for military hostages, but civilians as well. That will become clearer as you listen to the chilling story of Jessica Buchanan. First, let me take a minute to explain this episode. You'll hear Jessica Buchanan from a presentation that she gave to our workforce at the Defense Intelligence Agency. In addition to that, Jessica was gracious enough to discuss her ordeal in greater detail with our historian, Paul Isaacson. Paul also sat down with DIA's then chief of the intelligence community POW MIA analytics cell, which as you'll soon hear, was very much involved in this case. Jessica's story is one of compassion, of inspiration, perseverance, and of overcoming obstacles in the face of overwhelming challenges. And it begins not in Somalia, where she was abducted in 2011, but many years earlier. I was born in Portland, Oregon, to parents who were craftspeople. They were also people of strong faith. I was raised in an atmosphere of, to whom much is given, much is required. I was taught that we all had resources, we had talents, we had things to offer the world. And it was our responsibility to do what we could do to help each other. I was a child of the 80s and I remember footage of the famine in Ethiopia. And somehow that must have taken root somewhere deep in my mind. I grew up being exposed to the fact that others had less and that I could do something about that. I was given the freedom to discover what my gifts and talents were. and. The greatest gift my parents gave me was not holding me back when I got my passport and said, hey, I'm going to Africa. My first interest took root when I became aware of the plight of the child soldiers, things going on in places like South Sudan, Northern Uganda. I uh, ended up going to do some volunteer work and despite getting caught up in an LRA attack and being evacuated, being horrifically sick, my heart and help officially belonged to Africa. (laughs) I took a teaching job in Nairobi, Kenya in 2007. I met my husband shortly thereafter, and in 2009, I moved up to northern Somalia to be with him, and I began working for a Danish organization where we worked in community safety, armed violence reduction. I was actually living my dream. By 2011, Jessica Buchanan was in Somalia, a country that was ravaged by violence and terror. She was working for a Danish NGO, NGO is a non-governmental organization. She was developing classroom materials to help instruct the local people, children in particular, about how to avoid the landmines that had created a generation of amputees. Jessica was fully aware that the fact that she did charity work offered her no protection from local violence. And for those who traffic in hate, a Westerner is bad and an American is worse. As she and her coworker Paul Thurston were en route to that day's destination, accompanied, as always, by a full security detail. Her worst fears were realized when SUVs stopped her vehicle. I started hearing screaming and yelling. Very angry Somali men started banging the uh, butts of their guns, their AKs, on the window and the windshield, and my door was pulled open. 
the Somali uh, guard that was sitting next to me was pulled out and dragged to the ground and in climbed a very angry man holding an AK-47 to my head. He started screaming at the driver, drive. And so we drove into the desert for hours and hours. We would stop, we would change personnel, we would drive some more, we would stop, we would change vehicles. At one point we stopped again and we were forced out of the vehicles. One of the angry men, armed men, looks at me and he just says, walk out into the desert. This was the last time I ever tried to exert any kind of independence and I just said, no. And he looks at me and he says, walk. a good idea of what's waiting for me out in that desert and it's not going to be good. We go on like this for a few minutes and finally my colleague Paul comes over to me and he takes my hand and he just says, Jessica, we have to walk. And I know he's right. So we begin walking out into the desert, out into the dark. We trip over thorn bushes. We pick ourselves back up. We walk like this for a very long time until suddenly we are ordered to stop and get down onto our knees. I say goodbye to my husband, I say goodbye to my father, and I ask my mother who'd passed the year before to help me be strong, help me be dignified, because I believe I'm going to be executed. I don't understand what I've done to deserve this. I'm 32 years old. I never even got the chance to become a mother. And then I hear, the most beautiful word I have ever heard, and that's sleep. Lay down in the dirt and go to sleep. We're going to turn now to DIA historian Paul Isaacson, who talks with a defense intelligence agency analyst about the agency's involvement in the Jessica Buchanan case. Can you tell us your name and your job title? in the October 2011 timeframe of this case? My name's Catherine Omeg. Most people call me Cat, And I was the chief of the intelligence community POW MIA analytic cell, which is housed at DIA. And, and tell us a little bit more about the DIA's role when Americans are taken hostage. DIA actually has a pretty long history supporting personnel recovery and hostage events. Now, that support has evolved over the years since the late 1960s. Uh, the office that I was in was actually created in early 2000. It was formally stood up on 18 September 2001. Now, most people think it was because of September 11th, but uh, they actually were planning to have this office before the terrorist attacks that just, uh, the terrorist attack sort of spurred it along. So turning to the story of Jessica Buchanan, an American taken hostage in Somalia, how and when was DIA first aware of this situation? We actually learned about it the day the abduction occurred. Wow, okay, very fast. So DIA knew almost right away. Yes, yep. Okay, very interesting. Can you describe the process that occurs after we learn of a situation like this? Absolutely. So we start by analyzing every piece of information that we obtain, and we consider that within the context of what we already know. So for example, um, if there are other hostages uh, that were taken in that area, or if there are groups that operate there, um, we also have agreements with other agencies. So if we find out about a case first, we let them know. If they find out first, they let us know. We also have these standing collection requirements that cover the entire globe. Then once an event occurs, we'll issue a new collection requirement that is tailored to that specific situation. Uh, and we did that in Ms. Buchanan's case. What were the immediate needs when you first became aware of the situation? In other words, what were you, what, did, what had to be done right away immediately? So for our office, the cell, the two most important aspects of a case are the status of the victim. And by that, I mean, how are they? How are they? What's their condition? 
Are they alive? Are they being tortured? Are they being given food, water, medical attention? Uh, and we also want to know their location. So those are the two areas that we focus on. And how does DIA receive information like that? How do you get that information? So we'll get it through human sources, uh, through satellites, through other uh, data streams. Now, sometimes in a case, there's very little to work with. In her case, we received enough credible information, often enough, that we had a pretty good degree of confidence in our assessment. The first night of the abduction, I had no idea that I'd be moved 50 to 60 times. Sometimes we would spend a couple of days in one spot. Other times we would be moved five to six times in one night. Those experiences were particularly scary because I would have finally gotten myself to sleep and then somebody would get inches from my face and they would scream, standing, 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 which meant get up, get your few belongings and get in the car, we're moving. There was no privacy. I was living in a camp with dozens of men. Of course, my number one fear was that I was going to be killed, but my second fear was that of sexual assault. I was given a liter of water every couple of days, laced with diesel, to wash myself. Different men would take turns sleeping on my mat inches from me. I understood early on that there would be no escape. Food was sparse. In the beginning, we were given small tins of tuna and a package of cookies to get through the day. That would come every couple of days or so. Then we ended up sharing pasta or rice communally with the group. We would hunker down around a big, huge cast iron pot and eat spaghetti together, which eventually led to her fixed stomach problems. Intel gathered by the DIA, as well as other agencies regarding Jessica's deteriorating health issues, would prove vital in the decision-making process to resolve the situation. After a short break, Jessica reflects about one of the most disheartening parts of her ordeal. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, transnational terrorism. Do you know the threats? For more than 50 years, DIA officers have delivered defense intelligence expertise for our nation's leaders and warfighters. In the tradition of DIA's unclassified Soviet military power series, we bring you a new set of products that examines the greatest threats facing the U.S. today. Earlier this year, we released China Military Power. Now, Iran Military Power examines the core capabilities of Iran's military. Iran has expanded its capabilities and roles as both an unconventional and conventional threat in the Middle East. This report provides details on Iran's defense and military goals, strategy, plans, and intentions. Learn what DI's top intelligence experts have concluded about these complex threats and their potential impact on the United States and its allies. These assessments add an important viewpoint to the public conversation. Join us online. Welcome back to DIA Connections. We continue now with the story of American humanitarian aid worker Jessica Buchanan, who was abducted in Somalia in 2011 and DIA's role in trying to bring her home. Somalia had a huge number of children that were forced to fight in militias. And on the first day of her abduction, Jessica had an interaction with a young Somalian boy that made an indelible impression. I could hear lots of chattering behind me in the vehicle, and I heard a very high-pitched voice. And for a while I listened, and my thought was, there's a woman involved in the kidnapping, which would be very strange in a place like Somalia where women are kept very separate. Finally, my curiosity got the better of me, and I turned my head to see this woman, and I came face to face with a small child wearing chains of ammunition and holding um, an AK. He looked at me straight in the eye and just did one of these, nodded at me to turn around. I later learned that this child was named Abdullahi. He um, was nine years old. He was learning the family trade. He was one of the most traumatic parts of the kidnapping for me. 
He had already killed three people, and he was very willing and very eager to prove himself as a man amongst all of these other men. One morning early in the abduction, I was sitting under a tree, as I did every morning, and Abdullahi came sauntering over to me, and I could see he was wearing a red awareness bracelet, a silicone bracelet around his wrist that I hadn't noticed before. And as he got closer, I could see the writing on it was very familiar, and it turned out that it was one of the bracelets that I had created and put in our community safety package for children. Abdullahi had attended my education sessions that I had been doing in the communities. The reality that I had been kidnapped by the very group of people that I was working in and trying to help was startling and, as you can imagine, hard to deal with. Can you tell us about how you managed feelings? You you sort of allowed certain feelings, Mm -hmm. did not allow one feeling Mm -hmm. to occur? It took me probably like the first four or five weeks I let I was all over the place um I remember there were moments of such like high stress and extreme anxiety that I felt like I was gonna come out of my skin I was just so scared (laughs) um I think I started to accept that this was my reality and I wanted to survive and so I I am together with my colleague we had a few conversations where we couldn't allow ourselves to feel despair. We could feel anything. We could sit there and feel frustrated. We could feel mad, angry, hatred at the pirates, whatever. Um, And on the flip side, you could also feel happy and find ways of laughing and and amusement and and all of that. And, um, but we weren't allowed to let ourselves just to despair because despair was just kind of the end of the road. There's nowhere to come back from desperation. I had a realistic kind of sit down, come to Jesus moment with myself and decided I needed to make a strategy because I was going to survive. So I made a work plan for myself. I did exactly what I would do if I were at work. I decided to take my life, my 32 years in two year increments. And I was going to sit there under that tree for 12 hours a day and I was going to review every single thing that I had ever experienced in those two-year increments. So for instance, when I was six years old, I went to my first movie in a movie theater. My mother was wearing a blue dress and it had white flowers on it. I tried to remember what the popcorn tasted like. I went to go see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and so on and so on. I made a commitment to myself that during the 12 hours of daylight, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., I could worry. But when the sun went down at 6 p.m. till it came up at 6 a.m., I was not allowed to worry anymore. My greatest challenge was not to lose hope. In 2011, Catherine Omeg was chief of the intelligence community POW MIA analytics cell and was receiving intel on Jessica Buchanan. Here again is Catherine with Paul Isaacson. From your experience in dealing with situations like this, when people come back um, alive and safe, do you hear lots of stories like this? Or or have you heard things about, amazing things about how people have coped with their captivity? These are psychologically difficult situations, right? Hostages always live under the fear that they're going to get executed or mistreated. There's a saying that there's no such thing as a good day in captivity. So in some of uh, the other events we've heard, uh, people will think of all sorts of things to try and help get them through. So some people will really think a lot about escape. I remember one case years ago where A former captor was saying that he was trying to build rapport with his guards. And so anytime they would lead him somewhere, you know, he was handcuffed and blindfolded. He would purposely put his hand on top of theirs uh, so that their skin would touch. And he thought that that would help establish a connection and they would see him more as a human and not just, you know, this thing. So yeah, people will do all sorts of different things in captivity to try and survive and, and get through it. Does DIA work with other partners in the U.S. government on cases like this? 
Oh, absolutely. So when our cell was first created, uh, it was written into our mandates that DIA, CIA, NGA, and NSA all had to work together. Now, over the years, um, other organizations have expanded their role in this mission set, and we have great relationships with them. So uh, we work with all of the different elements within the Department of Defense, and then with other government organizations, you know, such as State Department and the FBI. We all bring something unique to the table, and it's, you know, just a good practice for us all to work together. Now, there can be a little bit of a flux depending on who the victim is and the circumstances of their capture. So for example, um, if the captors are criminal, terrorist, or a nation state. Now for the Department of Defense, we have certain authorities in a war zone that we don't have in other countries. But regardless of the situation, all of the different aspects of government that are involved, we all generally want the same thing, and that's to get the safe return of the victim. January 16th, 2012, I had my last proof of life call with our family communicator. I'd had a series of six calls where um, I would be put on the phone, we would be driven deep into the desert and put on um, a cell phone and talk to someone who said that they were negotiating for our family. This time, I was talking to a woman named Lisa, who said she was representing our family and taking messages back. As soon as I got on the phone, I started crying. I told her I was in a lot of pain. I had a urinary tract infection because I was living out in the desert. I was in totally unhygienic conditions, and I knew it was going into a kidney infection. I'd had one before and been hospitalized for over a week. Things were not looking good. She said, things are moving in the right direction. And then we were cut off. Right before we got cut off, I told her that I feared that I was going to die out into the desert. We turn again to Paul with Catherine Omig. Did DIA provide any assessments of what they thought it would take to actually resolve this kidnapping? Yes. When we study a case, uh, we do make assessments about how we think the case might resolve, such as if the captors you know, will kill the hostage or not. Now, that question also has some operational and even political implications. But our role is to make sure the people who make the decisions have the intelligence they need to do their jobs. Now, in my experience, uh, commanders will take on more risk for a live hostage than for remains. But at DIA, once we have opened a case, we don't close it until the person gets back. It's day 92 in the Somali desert. I think the date is January 24th, but I can't be sure anymore. I'm fairly certain it's around 3 o'clock in the afternoon because the sun is beginning to drop to the right side of my mat. And I wonder for the hundredth time, how many more suns am I going to watch drop down into the desert? I'm still the only woman living amongst 26 Somali men. I'm horribly ill with fever and in some of the most intense pain I've ever experienced in my life. I'm unable to stand up straight. And as I limp to a bush to be sick. My captors taunt me. They laugh at me, humiliate me. The leader in the camp demands that I put on my hijab, a hood and a scarf to cover my blonde head. He says I need to follow him into the desert. He's tossing around an AK-47 and he's screaming in my face, where is big money? as if I've hidden the big money in a hole out in the desert. I try to explain again. I'm a teacher by profession, a humanitarian aid worker at heart. I am a woman of very little means. There is no big money. Tears stream down my face as he draws the number seven in the sand 
He says, my people have seven days to come up with $18 million or... As the tears silently fall down my cheeks, he cocks his head and he looks at me curiously and he just says, why are you crying? And I say simply, because I don't want to die. You mentioned being an NGO, an aid worker. You didn't think that you were really going to warrant any extraordinary rescue. Did, so did you have any idea that what DIA was doing or any other agencies were doing to try to find you? No, I mean, it is embarrassing now looking back to think that I had no idea that anybody knew anything. I just figured, you know, I'm an NGO worker. Um, sure. I'm sure somebody in the FBI or, you know, somebody knows we're out here, but they've got better things to deal with. They've got terrorists to take care of. And, you know, there's much more important work. I'm just this aid worker teacher from Ohio. Like no one cares about me. And, um, and not in like, I feel sorry for myself kind of thing, but you know, it's kind of like, well, got myself into this mess, you know, like, I don't really expect much. Seems like your faith played a role, a pretty important role. Can you tell us how that, how that was? One of the strong mental images that kind of carried me, I mean, it got me up every morning, um, was that of my father. He, uh, it was the day after we'd lost my mom and he was just gripping the top rung of the kitchen chair and he was like just trying to support himself and he asked that we could all pray together and he was not a man prone to displays of emotion really he's a very quiet person and he was just understandably weeping and he just said I don't understand your ways but I choose to trust you. And so that became my mantra every morning. I got up off my mat and I just, sometimes I would physically like put myself in my dad's place and I would try to grip the rung of that imaginary chair and I would just, behind a bush, in private, out in the middle of the Somali desert, hold on to that chair for dear life and I would say, I don't understand your ways but I choose to trust you. So it's day 92. I'm incredibly ill. That night, I pulled my mat out into the open as we did every night. For some reason, the pirates wanted us to sleep out in the open instead of underneath trees. And as I did every night, I uh, had a talk with my mom. And I this time I said, Mom, things are really bad. I need you to go and tell God that he needs to do something right now because otherwise I'm not going to make it. There's not a whole lot of time left. So I go to sleep, and then I wake up in the middle of the night uh, with the urge to be sick. I stand up on my mat and the standard procedure for leaving my mat was to um, say the word toilet in English and wait to be acknowledged and given permission. Usually it was a grunt or a nod by one of the pirates. And um, this night when I, stand, I stood up, I said toilet, uh, no one would acknowledge me. There were nine pirates on guard that night out in the camp and everybody was completely passed out. I come back to my mat and I lay down, all the pirates are still passed out. I don't understand it, but I do have remember having the thought that it was a very dark night. There was no moon, there were no stars. And I did think if ever there were a time to try to escape, tonight would be the night. But I was too sick, I didn't know where I was. I can never carry enough water. So I laid down on my mat again, cover myself with my blanket, but I can hear this scratching noise getting closer and closer. 
I think it's these beetles that would come out, these dung beetles that would come out at night. They're harmless, but very annoying. They would get in my hair, they would get in my clothes, and I just wasn't in the mood. So I stood up and I shook my blanket out and I couldn't find any beetles, but I can still hear the scratching noise. And it feels like it's getting closer and I, I don't understand why I can't see anything. Do this a couple of times, I'm so exasperated. I know I need to sleep. Lay down, try to just tune it out. And not two minutes goes by when Helper, who's sleeping next to me, I hear him jump up. He starts whisper screaming at the other guys that they need to get up, get up. I pull the blank away from my face and I see this look of sheer terror. And he's holding a gun. 30 seconds later, the entire night just erupts into automatic gunfire. I'm hearing the worst sounds, people being hit by bullets, falling to the ground, moaning, breathing their last breaths. And all I can think is, I really am never going to survive. I get as low to the ground as I possibly can and I just start praying saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, over and over again. And then somebody grabs my arms, my shoulders, and my legs, and they just start shaking. I start kicking back, fighting back as much as I can. And then the blanket's pulled away from my face. And all I can see is black night and black masks. I just hear this voice that sounds very much like my brother. An American young man says, Jessica, Jessica, it's okay. Honey, we're the American military. You're safe now. We're going to take you home. I sit up and in my shock, all I can say over and over again is you're American. I don't trust him. And he pulls the mask off of his face and I can see, yes, he's American. He gets down on one knee and he has a bottle of medicine and he has clean, fresh water. And he says, we know you've been very sick. You look like you've been in a lot of pain. So he gives me a drink of water and somebody asks me if I'm hungry in the middle of all of this. Do you want a Snicker bar? Another guy says, okay, we've got to walk a bit. Do you know where your shoes are? I don't know where my shoes are. So it was like that Hollywood movie moment where he just stoops down and he picks me up and he throws me over his shoulder and he just starts running. And we run for a very long time until he puts me down wherever they have deemed is safe. And naturally my first question is, is my colleague okay? Is Paul okay? Did he make it out alive? And he's sitting there. And he takes my hand and we hug and check in and make sure everything's okay. And he says in his Danish accent, Jessica, do you know who these guys are? And I say, I don't really care. Jessica, this is SEAL Team 6. These are the guys that got Osama Bin Laden. So the one who threw me over his shoulder says, right, we've got to walk some more. I'm going to go back and I'm going to get your shoes. And something comes over me. And I say, while you're out there, I had this small black powder bag that I had carried with me throughout the captivity. And it doesn't have much in it, but it was mine. And can you please, will you please just bring it back for me? And he says, sure, yeah, no problem. So he runs out comes back with my shoes and he's carrying a suitcase that the pirates had given me to carry around clothes and things and I said oh I hate to tell you this but that's not the right bag and he looks at me with such familiarity like I have a wife she sent me out to get something and I brought the wrong thing back I better go out and get it and God love him he goes back out there and to God only knows what and he brings back my little black bag and I tell that story because it's funny, yes, but it's also so significant to me because for the first time in a really long time, somebody treated me like a human being.
So we go to an airport somewhere and we get off and we get on a plane and and we're going to a, a military base in Djibouti and everybody's celebrating again with the snicker bars and the salsa and the chips and the guys are getting me up to speed on who's playing in the Super Bowl and the NBA strike and all of that and in the midst of all of this another one of these fine young men comes over to me I'm sitting and he just gets down on his knees and he hands me a folded American flag and he um She says simply, welcome home, Jessica. And I think that's when the tears really started to fall because there was so much going on and there was so much shock. And in that moment, it all lifted. And I finally understood what I had been through and also understood what it means to be an American citizen. On the night of January 24th, 2012, Jessica Buchanan's nightmare was over. She was rescued. In the end, nine pirates lay dead. No seals had been harmed during the brief and very one-sided firefight. Once again, here's Paul Isaacson with Catherine Omig. While in captivity, Jessica told her colleague that she thought that nobody was coming for them because they weren't in the military. Kat, do you think people would be surprised to learn of DIA's role in situations just like this? Oh, absolutely. Um, You know, I've been supporting this mission for years, and I've met even military members who don't know how heavily invested DIA is in this mission and all that the agency does to support it. So it doesn't surprise me at all that the average American citizen would not know. This is an important mission to DIA. It's part of our DOD culture not to leave uh, personnel behind. And there can be DOD equities in these situations. You know, we can learn a lot from these type of events. And sometimes, like in Ms. Buchanan's case, uh, DOD assets can be used in the recovery. So DIA is a combat support agency. We absolutely support these cases. So Kat, I want to close with, with asking you a final question. You have spent many years of your career on this effort of bringing Americans home. What does that mean to you personally? Yeah, this is a wonderful mission. I mean, it, it's hard. It's analytically challenging. It definitely can take an emotional toll, but it is also incredibly rewarding. Some of the best professional experiences I've had have been because of this mission. And on a very personal level, I mean, we're all human and to be To know that you've been a part of bringing somebody back, it's just very moving and very rewarding. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, distinguished guests, and fellow Americans. Just minutes prior to President Obama's State of the Union address on January 25, 2012, he learned that the rescue mission, which he authorized, was successful. And the next day he said, As Commander-in-Chief, I could not be prouder of the troops who carried out this mission and the dedicated professionals who supported their efforts. As for Jessica, she was still in Djibouti, going through rounds of medical checkups and debriefings when she had a conversation with someone who in one sentence epitomized not only Jessica's story, but the mission itself. I was talking to a gentleman who was helping me, kind of aiding me through my route, and was kind of telling him this story. And he looks at me and he turns his arm over so I can see he's got tattoos on his forearm. And one was the prisoner of war and one was the missing in action emblem. And he said, you know, this isn't just for us. This is for every American citizen. We don't leave anybody, if we can help it, we don't leave anybody behind. Tears streamed down my face once again as I realized I had not been forgotten. I hope you enjoyed our podcast about the Defense Intelligence Agency's role in bringing them home. If you'd like more information about DIA, check us out on our social media pages or dia.mil. Thanks for listening to DIA Connections.